All right, so next lecture number two is going to be continuing our discussion of uh, types of data and, and descriptive summaries of them. So we covered, um, in the last class, we covered the different data types. There was, there was the nominal, uh, ordinal, there was discrete and continuous. And so we're going to talk about for each of those some ways of, of summarizing them numerically and graphically. And my apologize, apologies if this is going to be pretty basic for those of you who have statistics already, which I seem to recall is about half of you. Um, but I think it'll, there'll still be interesting parts in it for everyone, even if you have taken this stuff before. So let's review the vocabulary that we covered last class. Um, these were important things that we'll be returning to. There was the population, which is everyone of interest, and that depends on your research question. Um, it depends on, on who you're trying to describe or draw inference on. And the sample was a subset of that population. Record or observation, that was each observation that you make. So if you have several variables. Each record would be a measurement of those variables on one individual. Then the, the two main types of statistics, actually there were three. There was experimental design, which we don't cover a lot of in this course, a little bit of though. Um, and then there's descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive being what we're doing in the beginning of this course, and then we're going to move into inferential statistics more and more. So. A variable is any characteristic that we're interested in, that we record, that we collect data on. These were the main types, nominal, ordinal, and then discrete and continuous. Oh, someone, <laughs> someone's watching. That's good. I know that the sound is working. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, and we do have three viewers now. So uh, actually, one of them is here. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm today, gr I'm, I'm grouping these two discrete and continuous into the single uh, category of quantitative variables, meaning that the rules of, of arithmetic apply to them. Um, because as I mentioned, sometimes this, this, this uh, distinguishment between uh, discrete and continuous can be a little bit fuzzy. So I guess we were just getting to this towards towards the end. Our summaries of, um, we did cover this, of nominal and ordinal data. We use frequency tables. Frequency tables are um, mainstay of epidemiological papers, table one of, um, of almost any epidemiological study will basically be a, a nicely formatted table of, of frequencies. Um, and the graphical uh, analog of the, of the frequency table is the bar plot. They're interchangeable, one's visual, one's, one's numeric. Um, as an aside, they're actually, I, I feel like it's kind of an antiquated debate, but, but there are arguments among statisticians about whether a table or uh, a plot is better. I don't know, I don't get involved in arguments like that, it depends. <laughs> <clears throat> pie charts. The other alternative, you learned that I don't like pie charts, unless it's this one. This one I actually like a lot. Um, if you're referring to how much pie you've eaten, then it's the ideal way to represent uh, to represent that, showing the actual the actual data. Um, but the the reason in, in other cases that I don't that they're they're not really a favored method is that they're not very quantitative. So they're good for infographics and that, but as far as being able to read them quantitatively, you know, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what proportion of the pie I've eaten here. It's maybe somewhere between 20 and 30% or something like that, but it's hard to read it precisely. Whereas if we made a bar chart of it like this, it would be um, not nearly as, as visually stimulating, but it would be much more quantitative in that we can see exactly what proportion here I have eaten. Um, so here's just an example. If we have um, four students out of 40 who got an A, 
Uh, the frequency of A's then is four. The proportion is four out of 40, so 0 0.1. The percentage is 10%. Um, and any of these we can use in our uh, frequency table or bar plot. Sometimes you will see them showing the actual numbers, sometimes with percentages, sometimes with both. Moving on to quantitative variables. So I lumped together the, the ordinal and the nominal variables. We use the same things to, to describe those generally, um, but a completely different set of plots for quantitative variables. And this is just, this is a, a starting point for, um, for graphs for a single quantitative variable. There, there are others. Um, but these are kind of the, the basic ones that, that everyone should be able to recognize. And I've organized them here according to amount of detail against the amount of summarization. So at the top here being the most detailed, the dot plot would just be actually showing every individual data point. So that is showing all of your data graphically. You're not actually summarizing it. You're just showing it on a plot. So that can be good. If you don't have too much data and you just want to represent them exactly, can start getting hard to read if you have a lot of data. Uh, so moving down for some more summarization is the histogram. I'll give you some examples as, as that. Um, basically, that is converting your data into a categorical variable and then making a bar plot of, um, of your, your categorized data. And then the box plot, um, which includes both some quantitative and qualitative measures together. And that is a favorite of mine and of, um, of many statisticians, although it is one that is not as recognized by the, by the wider public. Maybe becoming more so, I hope. All of them, probably the dot plot even, um, uh, but the things that we're going to want to read out of them are the central tendency, so where most of the data fall, what kind of the middle of it is, the spread, how concentrated or spread out it is, skew, that is like whether it's symmetric or tends to look different on, its, uh, on the left than on the right, uh, and outliers. These are like basic qualitative understandings of a quantitative variable. Here's an example of a dot plot. Um, this is uh, one way to show it, especially for, this would be for a discrete variable where we have uh, counts and we have multiple observations with exactly the same value. And duplicates are just being stacked on top of one another. So uh, in this case, it's actually fairly easy. This is almost like a histogram. Okay, it's, it's showing, you can actually see by height uh, how many of each observation there are. So each one of these is an observation. We're seeing all of the observations in this data set. Um, so yeah, maybe some bidding uh, has been done if this was originally a, a, um, a uh, numeric variable, or maybe this is a count. Um, account variable. It looks based on the spacing between these. Um, it's about every one, two, three, four, five, uh, six. So they're only, they're spaced out with um, more than 10 values shown together. So, um, so it looks like there's, there's some binning done here, kind of like a histogram. So histogram, here's an example of um, a number of weights shown. So we've taken, we've taken some weights between 100 and 260, grouped them into categories, and there are three bins per, uh, per 50. So that's about 16 pounds 
within each bin. So everyone within that 16 pound range is just counted here. And we have frequency on the y-axis. So these um, falling over to the y-axis, these are the actual numbers of observations that fell within this range. So this one would be about 106, uh, wait, this would be about 185 to 200. And there are four observations that fell that fell in that range. Pretty, in, pretty intuitive, right? You can see right away that um, the most common value is six. We're a little bit skewed to the right. So it's, it's a nice graph to read. Even within um, a histogram, so you're going to have to decide. This is descriptive statistics. Is is um, it's not an exact science. It's a it's a descriptive qualitative undertaking, and and your objective is to describe both simply and intuitively, but also accurately your data, and to get across the data set as you understand it in an intuitive and easy to read way. Um, and there are choices to make in doing that, and there's no formula for deciding what to do. You're going to have several types of graphs to choose from, like I just showed you, um, and then there are choices for each type of graph as well. So a histogram, you go ahead and make a histogram plot in SPSS or in R, it is going to have an algorithm that will automatically decide how many bins you should have, and it will plot your data using that. But that's not the only choice that could have been made. Um, these are the same data in three different bin sizes. So here is the most summarization. So they're being put into the biggest bins. And here is the least. They're being put into, into pretty small bins. Um, and you know you can see you can see more detail here. You can see some bins, some bins are empty. And you know that may or may not be an important thing to, to get across, um, but certainly if you have too wide of bins, you're going to miss something about your data set uh, that you'll be able to see with with finer finer bins. So if this were a really important data set that you need to know inside and out, you might want to make a few different histograms like this just to make sure that. Um, you're not missing anything. In this case, you know, when I look at this and I look at this, I kind of get the same picture. You know, I, I don't think that there's anything misleading about um, about this one on the right. Basically, the you know the the most frequent value is in around here. It's kind of skewed to the right, um, and. That's about all there is that to, to say about, about this data set. And it looks kind of the same each way. So you know, I think it would be fine to choose this one, the most summarization here. It'd be fine to choose this one, too. I would tend to think that if this were for showing to an audience, this might be more detail than you need. But you know, that's, that's, my, that's my take on it. Oops. So we've already looked at these a little bit, but these are what we're going to look at in a histogram, the center, the spread, and the shape. So the centering, that's kind of the highest point in the, in the histogram. Um, well, it's, I guess there, there are different types of centers, which we'll get to. That would be sort of your mode, the highest point. Um, the median would be where half are above, half are below, and you can kind of determine this from from a uh, from a histogram just by counting. But it kind of looks here like the mode is somewhere around there. Uh, the spread of the distribution that's really easy from a histogram. Um, at least the, the range of it is one type of spread. You can see it's from about 100 to, uh, this is 250. So our range here, 100 to 250, you can tell that. 
and the shape. And as I mentioned, that one is, is slightly skewed to the right. So just to make a look, make totally clear what I mean by skew, an unskewed distribution, that's a symmetric distribution. It looks like a mirror image such as this. You can put a, a middle point and it looks exactly the same to the left and to the right. Looks the same um, when you're looking at, at it as it would in a mirror. Here's a left skew and a right skew. Some classic, some classic examples of skew would be lifespan um, is a left skewed variable. So if, if on our x-axis here <coughs> is how long someone born today is going to live, um, and the y-axis is the, is the probability, or this is just like a very smooth uh, histogram, we would call this actually a density plot because it's totally smoothed out. You have a few people who do not live very long and a lot of people who live to be about 75 years old. And then it drops off steeply after that. Income is a classic right skewed variable. You have a lot of people with, with a pretty modest income, drops off steeply down to this would be an income of zero. And has a far right tail. So this would be Donald Trump somewhere out here. Has a very long right tail. You can also assess modality from a box plot as long as it's not summarized too much. Um, unimodal on the left, the bimodal on the right means it has two major modes. We have one here at, a, at zero and another one at nine. You can have trimodal distributions, not very common, um, but bimodal is a pretty common occurrence. So an outlier, there, there are some definitions of outliers. Um, in a box plot, there is a formal definition of, of, an, of an outlier, and what is shown as an outlier. Uh, but on a histogram, it's just going to be something that is quite a ways away from the rest of the distribution. So we call that an outlier just because it looks like an outlier. It looks different from the rest, and there's only one of them there. Um, outliers do deserve attention. They might result from a problem in your data collection, um, or it might just be something you don't understand, and it might be something interesting. Um, but we want to be aware of them. So the box plot, which is um, probably my favorite uh, representation of a single distribution or even multiple distributions. I'm showing here on first is a density plot. So this would be uh, this is a normal distribution, and it's showing the probability um, of, of a value between, so this is some, let's, it's a severity measure. It can be between 0 and 100. The mean is 50. The spread, it goes up about um, 40 above and below, below there. Um, and so this is just showing the probability of having a value anywhere between 0 and 100, with that being highest at, at 50. So the box plot is an extremely compact but fairly quantitative representation of this. Um, it shows a center line, which is the median, not the mean, also known as the second quartile. And we'll go over these more uh, later. But then the the two sides of the box are at the first and third quartile. So this is telling us that one quarter of the data fall um, at a value below this, about 42, and one quarter fall above 58, about. So we've got three quartiles of the data just by looking at the box. Then you have these so-called whiskers that go 
from the median to 1.5 times the interquartile range. So the interquartile range is the, the distance between the first and third quartile. It's the width of the box. So you take 1.5 times that and add and subtract that to, um, to the median. There's one exception to when it's 1.5 times the interquartile range. If there's no data point that far out, then you only draw it as far as the, the furthest data point. And then if there is one outside of that plus or minus 1.5 times the IQR, you draw that data point and you call it an outlier. You can also, if you have two variables or you have the same measurement on two different populations, such as height of males and females, you can put them side by side on a box plot, makes it very easy to compare uh, those ages between the two groups. <clears throat> um, so that's, that's, in a nutshell, your dot plots, your uh, histograms, and your, uh, and your box plots. So let's talk a bit about numerical, numerical summaries. The big one that, that we use is the mean, just the sum of all of your observations divided by the number of them. This, by the way, is what we call sigma notation. And I'll use it a few times during, during the, the semester to describe various things. It just means a summation. So, um, if I here is, is an indicator for the individual, then this just means an X is something like the weight. It just means we sum them and then divide by the total number. So an important thing to know about the mean is that it's not resistant. Um, it, is influ it is influenced by skew and by outliers. In fact, it's fairly strongly uh, influenced by outlying values. And I, for this, actually simulated in R four different uh, distributions. So I simulated observations from four different distributions. A normal distribution, and I know we haven't talked about what that is yet, but, um, but we'll be using it lots. Then from a log normal distribution, that's, a, that's uh, data where if you take a log of it, then you have a normal distribution from an exponential distribution, which means that if you look at that probability plot or a histogram, um, it looks like an exponential curve. So I don't know if you remember what, uh, what that looks like, but it basically starts high and then gets, gets lower and lower as, as you move to larger values. And a uniform distribution, which is just a set two bounds, bounds at minus two and two, minus two and two, and said the probability of this value being anywhere between minus two and two is the same. So these are all different types of, of quantitative uh, data that, that you might encounter in real life. Um, and you would be able to tell these properties by making a box plot. Yes? I know we haven't guessed that yet. What would be the main difference between a normal distribution and a uniform distribution? They're quite different distributions. So if the, the easiest way to explain it um, or to understand it would be, be by looking at the probability of, um, of seeing any particular value. And if with the uniform distribution, that would just be flat. So your probability is the same if it's between uh, minus two and two, equal probability anywhere between minus two and two. Whereas with a normal distribution, if it's centered at zero, the probability is the highest at zero and it falls off. Um, and normal di or uniform distributions have to be bounded. They have to have an upper and a lower bound, whereas a normal distribution does not. So you can have outliers in the normal. But this is actually as good a way as any by looking at this box plot to, to see what what they look like because you can you can see 
here on the normal distribution, you kind of see lots of data points in here near the center. I know it's a little bit hard to see on the slide here, but there's lots in the middle. There's fewer up here. And then you know, there's one that extends beyond the whisker here. So you can kind of see that, that bunching of data in the center of the distribution. Um, the log normal distribution is a highly skewed distribution. That's because you've taken a, a set of data points like this and exponentiated them. So the ones that were large to begin with become really, really large after you exponentiate them. Um, but all of the ones that are kind of low just get bunched together down here. So if you remember what like an e to the minus x uh, plot looks like, it just looks really big near zero, and then it goes down to zero as x gets large. And that's what we see with these data points here. You see a high probability of them being down near zero, and then a long tail of redu reducing probabilities. So there are lots of outliers here. And I, oh, I, I should have mentioned I've sh the, the black line on here, that's a part of the box plot. That's the median. And then I added these red lines where the mean is. So on the normal distribution, the mean and the median are basically in the same place. On the log normal distribution, the mean is quite a bit above the median. So mm -hmm. that is evidence of a skewed distribution or of outliers. And in fact, even if you don't make a plot, if you just do a numerical summary of your data that includes the mean and the median, you can, you can take a guess that, that there are either some outliers or some skew here just because of that difference in, in the mean and the median. Uh, so the exponential distribution, that's a, a little bit different because it would be like you took a uniform distribution and, um, and the exponent of that. So it doesn't have the outliers to begin with. That, that a normal distribution has. So there's, there's less in the way of outliers and skew here, but there is still a little bit of skew. You see uh, three outlier points above and none below. And you see quite a few data points down here and a reducing number as you get larger. You see a mean that's higher than the median. So all those things point to some skew um, and some outliers in this in in these data. And then finally, the uniform distribution. Here, there's no skew. It's just uniform between minus two and two. The mean and the median are in very close to the same place. Any questions about that? I'm trying to give give you some kind of. Um, you know, this is a nice kind of sandbox for looking at box plots because I created these distributions. I know what they are, um, and you can kind of get the hang of when you see a, a box plot of data that, that you've never seen before, you can maybe take a guess as to what uh, ones of these distributions it's most similar to. So the median, that's just the middle data point. It's the one where half of your, your observations are above and half are below, uh, also called the 50th percentile or the second quartile. Uh, this this um, thing in the middle here, uh, whether it, you know if you have an odd number, it can just be the middle observation. Um, and if it's even, then it's the average of the two middle observations. Actually, that, that is the easiest way to do it by hand, um, but it's not always the way that your statistical software calculates the median. Um, there's always fun when, when people are using different software, and you'll find that if you use Excel and you use SPSS, you get different answers for the median. Um, and in R, actually, when you calculate a quantile, it gives you an option of seven different methods for calculating a quantile, because there are tons of different ways that people use to calculate the median. Um, usually, it doesn't matter that much. If you have, if you have 100 data points or some relatively large number of data points, they'll all give you 
very close to the same answer. If you have like five data points or something like that, then there can be a big difference between them. So just be aware, median is not always the median. But I, I don't care about it that much, but you should be aware of it. <laughs> Where there's a difference, it's because the median is not entirely clearly defined. Um, so yeah, here are just some examples. The, the point that I'm making here is that it's resistant to outliers. So if you have one, two, three, four, five, your median is three. If you have one, two, three, four, and a million, the median is still three. Um, if you get rid of this last data point, then it's 2.5, at least by the method that we're using. Seven doors. The median is, I don't know who that is, uh, happy or something. And if we replace one of them with a tall guy, Shaquille O'Neal, he did play for Boston when I was there, um, then it's still the guy in the middle. Resistant outliers. All right, so the mode is, is makes more sense really in, in categorical data than it does in numerical data. When we categorize into a bar plot, you can still talk about the mode. Um, here it's just this, it's just this highest one. You might argue that this could be a bimodal distribution with this being a second mode, maybe. Um, note that, that for a quantitative variable, the mode is not precisely defined. And if you are determining it from a bar plot, it's gonna depend on how many bins you, you have in your bar plot and just like the number of modes you see might depend on your number of bins. So similarly to the median, um, your answer can vary depending, uh, depending on how you're calculating it. So here's just another look at, uh, at the central tendency and skewness looking at probability uh, plots. So, here is our variable x. This is a frequency or a probability. Um, and this is for the distribution itself rather than for our data set because it's smooth. This is the probabilities you would have for an infinite number of data points. Um, and I just put this here to, to make it very clear how uh, these three measures of central tendency differ depending on skew. Um, when you have a right skew, you'll see the median and then the mean further to the right of the mode. And when you have a left skew, it's the other way. So percentiles and quantiles, uh, these, are, these are great measures of both of a, um, of a distribution and potentially of saying how an individual stacks up compared to uh, the rest of the distribution. The, so the p percentile is that value below which p percent of your values fall in the distribution. Um, so if we're talking about, uh, you know, you use this to talk about test scores and you can take any particular test score, put it on this distribution and say what the percentile is, the percent of, um, of values below that below that particular point. So it's used in descriptive statistics. This is also very important for, for inference. And you'll be using um, not actually percentiles, but probabilities when you're doing, you're doing Z tests and T tests and that. You'll be looking at plots like this, calculating the, uh, the quantile of a particular value and using that to accept or reject your null hypothesis. The quartiles are just a um, the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles. Um, I think that's enough said about that. 
Oh, oh, I just meant to mention here the interquartile range. Um, again, that is the difference between your, your third quartile or your 75th percentile and your first, which is a measure of spread. Um, range is one way to measure the spread. That's just the difference between your maximum, your maximum value and your minimum value. Um, and that's kind of useful just for knowing all of the possible values that you've observed in your data set. This, of course, is, is not a robust measure of spread. In fact, it's the most sensitive measure that there is of spread because it's so sensitive to outliers. So even if you have some large number of data points in a, in a region, you add one single data point that's an outlier and it can completely change the range. Makes sense, right? Another measure of spread and the one that we will use most often in this course are the variance and standard deviation. So the variance, um, it's, it's a nice, easy thing to measure um, or to calculate, and it has a lot of useful statistical properties. All you have to do to calculate it are first, you need the mean, and for every data point, actually I can show it, I'll show it to you in this formula here, so we have the sigma summation notation. This x bar, this is the mean, and xi, these are each of the individual observations. So it's just the difference um, of each observation from the mean, you square those up, and then you divide by, now it depends if you are talking about a sample or a population. Usually we're going to be talking about a sample and you divide it by n minus 1. Um, as an aside, there's a reason why it depends whether this is the um, sample or the population. If you, if this is a census and you have all of the data that there is, then your calculation of the mean x bar is exact, right? If you have a sample, it's just an approximation of the mean based on your sample. Um, and, and it turns out that you will slightly underestimate these deviances because your mean is the value that will minimize those deviances in your data set. So it's a very small difference unless, and it, unless you have quite a small sample. Um, but if you do have a small sample, you can imagine, let's take the example of only n equals 2. You take a sample of 2. Where is your mean going to be? Right in the middle, exactly. And that is the point that is going to minimize your deviances. So, you know, your, your true mean is not right in the middle. It's somewhere else, and you have a kind of lousy estimate of where, of where it is. So you've placed it in the spot that is going to minimize the deviance, and it is going to um, underestimate this sum of squares. So um, by dividing by n minus 1, that, that balances that out. So if that were population, we would have divided by 2, with n equals 2, but if it's just a sample, then we're dividing by 1. So actually, the estimate of the variance is double because it's a, because it's a sample. Does that make a little bit of sense? This n minus 1 is actually uh, the number of degrees of freedom involved in this calculation of the variance. And we'll talk more in a later class about degrees of freedom. So variance, the square root of that is the standard deviation. Here are those distributions again. Um, and I've gone ahead and plotted out what this calculation looks like graphically. So on this, I'm just showing the deviations from the mean. And I'm showing the, the actual true mean because I know them. These are uh, distributions that I generated from a, a theoretical 
uh, their samples that I generated from a theoretical distribution. So a normal distribution with mean zero. Um, and I'm drawing here these, these red lines are just the difference of x i minus x bar. So actually, now here's a question for you. If I draw this zero, or if I draw this horizontal line here exactly at zero, because I know that's what the mean is, would I divide by n minus one or by n? Mm -hmm. Well, um, it, well, let me ask you two different questions and have you match up the right answer. So in one case, I draw that horizontal line at zero. And in another case, I draw it where I've estimated the mean to be from the sample. So in which of those cases would I use n minus one? Only one of them. The latter. Yeah, the latter, where I've estimated the mean. Yeah, if I drew it in exactly the right place, then that mean is not estimated, we can use n. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, the, the key point is whether this mean here is estimated from the sample or whether it's known for the entire population. That's right. Yeah. So um, the, the, the variance for, for that sample, this n minus 1 is a correction for, that, uh, for, the, for the way that we've calculated the mean, if that, if that makes it clear. So even though it's a sample, you want the standard deviation of that sample, you would just divide by n if you happen to know the precise, um, the precise mean. So in the case with the two data points, if we estimate the mean in the center, we use n minus 1. If we happen to know that the mean is actually over here and we just use that, don't calculate it, then you would just, then you would divide by n. Um, so you can kind of see the outliers here in the log normal and the exponential distribution, just these deviances that are quite a bit larger. And plotting the squared devi deviations, now they're all positive. These outliers are even more extreme. So, you know, here's what they look like for the normal distribution. Um, and now with the squares, they stick out quite a bit further. And these, uh, Outliers in the log normal, now they're really, really extreme. All these other ones just look like kind of little, I don't know, grass turf or something by, by comparison. And these are, like, these are like trees. So it's kind of a good, you can see here that these few data points are gonna contribute a huge amount to your estimate of the standard deviation. Um, so it's not robust to, to skew in outliers. A few properties of standard deviation that you need to know. One is that it has the same units as the observed variable. If we're talking about pounds, then it has units of pounds. Um, variance, of course, would be the square of that unit. It measures, it is a measure of the spread of the data. It's zero only if all of if it's a trivial distribution, if, if every value is exactly the same. If there's any difference, then the standard deviation is positive. Um, and as the spread gets larger, S gets larger. So I'm plotting on here now the, um, a couple different measures of, of spread for these four distributions. So we've got the, the mean and the median still here. And then the first red, thinner red line, that's the mean plus or minus one standard deviation and the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. So you can see the, um, for a normal distribution, 
your box plot looks kind of like, you know, the, the outsides of the box show you one standard deviation and the whiskers show you, you two standard deviations. It's, you know, kind of similar um, for a normal distribution. Um, and also for the uniform distribution, that's, that's approximately the case. Um, but for either of these skewed distributions, you see the standard deviations extending well outside of, of um, the, the, the box and whiskers. As if you don't have enough ways now to assess that something is skewed. It should be, you know, comparing, these just kind of give you some more tools at your disposal. If you're ever looking at a paper and you see a report of the, um, you know, of the standard deviation and you see where you can see what the most extreme outlying values are, you might be able to piece together whether that estimate of the standard deviation um, was strongly influenced and whether there is evidence against it actually being a normal distribution just by the, you know, the location of the furthest outliers, um, difference between the mean and the median, for example. So these are a few other measures of spread, and these are robust measures. Uh, the interquartile range is, is kind of a commonly used measure. And if you have a distribution that is strongly skewed or has large outliers, this might be a good choice for reporting its spread other than the standard deviation. This median absolute deviation, not super commonly used. Um, but it's just involving median. You take the difference between each data point and the median, and then take the median of that. So completely um, robust outliers. Um, and of course, the range. All right, so just to, to wrap up now, all of the things that we covered today. Um, the three different types of, of plots for numeric data, mean, median, mode of numeric data, all about the percentiles and quartiles and quantiles, these different measures of spread, the summation notation, unimodal, bimodal, and skew and outliers. I think that's all that I have for you today. All right, so we're done a few minutes early today. We can take um, take a uh, ten minute break or so and convene downstairs. Mm -hmm.